By the beginning of the first century BC, the Roman Republic was imploding. Roman values were under siege. Slave revolt stunned the ruling class. Something had to give. One of Rome's best-known citizens was born to wealthy parents in 100 BC. As with many young Roman aristocrats, Julius Caesar had a strong sense of destiny. As a child, he dared to claim he was descended from the goddess Venus. Caesar's first official post was as a military officer in Spain. There, the 30-year-old Caesar stared at a statue of Alexander the Great. How had he achieved nothing, he wept, when at his age, Alexander had conquered the world. Roman politicians had always staged huge spectacles to impress the voters. In 63 BC, Caesar outdid them all. 640 gladiators fought to the death at his first public games. It was an unprecedented display of power. But Caesar knew there were two secrets to gaining power in Rome. One was playing to the people. Commanding a successful army was the other. In 59 BC, Caesar became military commander over Gaul, modern-day France. Nine years later, a million Gauls were dead or enslaved. It was a flagrant act of genocide. At the end of his term in Gaul, Caesar headed back to Rome. Much like Sulla, Caesar was returning from war with an army loyal to him, not Rome. Like Sulla, Caesar wanted something the Republic could never allow, total power. In January 49 BC, Caesar committed the ultimate act of treachery. He persuaded his army to march on Rome, and like Sulla, began a civil war. The Senate quickly chose Pompey, conqueror of the East, to defend the Republic. Once Caesar's friend and son-in-law, the two were now bitter enemies. Rome's two greatest generals met in Greece. Pompey was no match for Caesar and his brutal fighting force. He fled to Egypt, but was eventually captured and killed. The Republic of Rome was now Caesar's. But Caesar had other things on his mind. In Egypt in 48 BC, he met the young queen Cleopatra. They fell in love and had a child. Cleopatra persuaded Caesar to help her overthrow her brother and co-ruler so that she could rule by herself. In 46 BC, she accompanied Caesar back to Rome. Vulnerability was not something Caesar understood. When he returned to Rome, he said, Veni, Vidi, Vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. That evening, he threw a banquet for 22,000 of Rome's poorest citizens. Hypnotized, the people did the unthinkable. They voluntarily voted Caesar the absolute powers of a dictator. Caesar then shocked everyone. He used his total control, not for revenge,
but social reform. Caesar gave the Roman poor what they wanted. He made sure no Roman citizen ever went hungry. He gave grain to the poor and land to his soldiers, paid for by himself. Caesar, the benign dictator, was incredibly popular. Like Tiberius, he was a little too popular for some. Here was a man who was desperate to be king of the Roman people, master of the whole world. A man who believes such an ambition to be morally right must be insane. Cicero. In February 44 BC, he went too far. Caesar asked the people to elect him dictator for life. To accept absolute power forever was an open insult to his Republican peers. Cicero was disgusted and retired from political life in protest. The Senate wasn't so meek. They invited Caesar to explain his actions. It was the Ides of March. By mid-morning, the crisis was over. At the foot of a statue of Pompey lay Caesar's body, stabbed 35 times. Rome's poor were outraged. At Caesar's funeral, they lit torches from the pyre and set fire to the houses of the assassins. That night, a comet blazed across the sky. It seemed an omen. Julius Caesar, the champion of the poor. The citizens of Rome declared him a god. That changed everything. For the poor had made it clear they valued the gifts of a dictator more than the empty promises of a republic. Two rivals came forward to vie for the dead dictator's absolute power. Octavian, Caesar's 18-year-old grandnephew and heir, and Mark Antony, Caesar's closest friend and ally, no stranger to the politics of intimidation. In 43 BC, Antony raised an army and surrounded the Senate. The Republic was once again under siege. Cicero came out of retirement to attack Antony. He thought Octavian was the Republic's last chance. Cicero confronted Antony in the Senate. Your ambition to reign is as fierce as Caesar's. I would gladly offer my own body if my death could redeem the freedom of our nation. Antony took Cicero at his word and two months later he ordered the murder of the Republic's boldest defender. His hands were cut off and put on public display in Rome. The Roman Republic was in crisis. In 33 BC, ten years after the assassination of Julius Caesar, Mark Antony and Octavian were still fighting for control of the Roman world. The ghost of civil war was back. The Roman people were desperate for a change. The rule of a single man is the only remedy for a country in trouble. Cassius. Octavian finally defeated Antony in 31 BC to become the undisputed ruler of the entire Roman world. But his greatest victory would be one of statesmanship. Octavian was poised to redefine the very meaning of power in Rome. 
He understood patronage was the secret to control in Roman society. With Rome's vast treasury at his disposal, he set about making every Roman his client, obligated to him, the universal patron. Octavian handed out huge cash bonuses to Rome's army. He now had the undivided loyalty of over 400,000 soldiers. He then played to the people like never before, increasing the grain handout and building huge aqueducts to bring fresh water to Rome's poor. Octavian then focused on the most important ritual of all. He staged the most lavish games Rome had ever seen. Wild beasts and gladiators fought for days in the packed arena. Seduced, the people voted him all the power he asked for. The Roman Senate then stunned everyone. In 27 BC, they allowed Octavian what they had denied Caesar, the constitutional right to absolute power for life. Octavian took the name Augustus, the Sacred One. Rome, once a bastion of open government, had willingly become an empire ruled by a single man. Octavian, now Caesar Augustus, had become Rome's first emperor. But for the vast majority of people in the Roman Empire, that didn't matter. For them, Augustus was a savior. He offered the peace and stability they had craved for nearly a century. From the Atlantic to the Euphrates, from Spain to Syria, people were free to think about something other than war. It was the Pax Romana, Rome's golden age. It was the longest period of peace Europe had ever known. Yet the architect of peace would never enjoy his own triumph. For Augustus was obsessed by a question that plagued all Roman emperors. What would happen in Rome when he died? The dilemma of dynastic succession would haunt Augustus for the rest of his life. <laughs> 